What's up, home dogs? Welcome to part two of Nuclear No First Use, the November, December 2020 public forum topic. In part one, we went over the background and then I hit my Prezi video video limit of 15 minutes. So that's why we are doing a part two pro and con. If you are on part two, say thank you by hitting the like button and leaving like 17 different comments below. Just type A, B, C, D, E, enter, 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 enter. Uh, let's go, guys. Uh, this we already did. So brief history of nuclear weapons, a video that doesn't work. Uh, TNT equivalents of warheads, the hardware to deliver it to target, and some key terms. What are some reasons why the U.S. should implement a no first use policy? In short, if I can read this, we're as close to a civilization ending nuclear war as we've ever been. We may, in fact, be on the brink of nuclear war. Strategic ambiguity only heightens the risk of conflict. We should follow India and China and adopt the no first use policy. Let's first talk about the brink arguments. So why are we closer than ever to nuclear war? First argument is tactical nuclear weapons. So these are being spearheaded by Russia, but the U.S. has also deployed a number of tactical nuclear weapons. Tactical as opposed to strategic nuclear weapons are small, little tiny, cute nuclear warheads that can blow up, let's say, um, a, a building or uh, some troop position or a base communication center. Um, uh, as opposed to strategic warheads, which blow up like a city. So they're like smaller uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, these tactical weapons would be easier to use because one would presume that you wouldn't respond to a targeted nuclear strike with a general overwhelming civilian destroying nuclear strike, right? That's the assumption. I think that's um, been Russia's assumption in developing them that they could uh, use these especially in the event of war with uh, NATO countries um, to take out large troop positions on the battlefield uh, that could be really useful, but they're not so um, intense that they would trigger um, a response of a strategic nuclear weapon. So the U.S. and Russia are both developing these. This makes the first use of nuclear weapons in, you know, 70 years much, much more likely because they're developed to use them. These these weapons aren't developed as a deterrent. They're developed for use on the battlefield, right? And both countries have them now. Uh, so that's one thing that brings us closer to the break now than ever. Number two, um, AI decision-making. So uh, countries are increasingly using AI uh, to make decisions about military strategy, to play through war games uh, of military strategy, also to decide when would be the right time to l launch a nuclear weapon, how many, and even to um, set up some dead hand uh, control methods where like AI could take over and handle everything if you were uh, your your con command and control centers were destroyed or or if people were assassinated, for example. Uh, next, cyber threats. So in the evidence pack, we have a whole uh, card on cyber threats. It talks about a number of the ways, a big paper talks about a number of the ways that cyber threats makes uh, the use of nuclear weapons more likely. There have even been countries like the U.S. and like Russia that have said that they would use nuclear weapons in response to some kinds of cyber attacks, specifically the kinds of cyber attacks that target your nuclear weapons capability, right? So if a first attack wasn't a nuclear bomb incoming, but instead was a cyber attack that took out all of your command and control infrastructure so that you no longer had the ability to launch a nuclear weapon or had very limited ability, this could be grounds to uh, try your best to launch one in retaliation. So cyber threats also makes it more likely. It also just adds to the confusion of uh, war, a lot of the cyber attack capabilities. Um, lastly, flashpoints are sometimes more heated than ever. So I'm filming this from where I live in Taiwan. Uh, China looks like it's been gearing up this year for a Taiwan invasion, which could be um, a flashpoint of a China-US war, right? Ukraine also always uh, remains contentious. Uh, f potential flashpoint for Russia, NATO uh, nuclear war that the U.S. would then have to get involved in. Um, India, Pakistan tensions um, are once again, seems like they're always high. India, China tensions, once again, seems like they're always high. And uh, North Korea, of course. So like there aren't very many countries that have nuclear weapons that aren't potentially involved in some kind of flashpoint or could be involved in some kind of flashpoint situation. So all of these things are saying that we're on the brink of nuclear war. Um, each of these, maybe the possibility isn't extremely high that it will happen, but, you know, 1% is way, way, way too high and all stacked up. If we have 20% of a conflict happening over the next hundred years, that's far too high of a chance to risk human extinction for, right? 
Uh, the only or one of the best ways that we can solve this is with a no first use policy. It would bring down the threshold of escalate of uh, escalation to nuclear war, bring it bring up bring up the threshold of escalation, and make things more simple. It would make the world a safer place. So first break. Second, strategic ambiguity bad. Remember, strategic ambiguity is a thought that the United States should not tell anyone what our nuclear policy is. We should certainly not have a no first use policy because that will make it too simple for our enemies to know what are we doing, what are we thinking, uh, what will our move be uh, according to their moves, right? So this is card is saying strategic ambiguity is bad. Um, not establishing a clear policy leaves room for accidental escalation in many situations. So uh, this last point is key, that a radar can detect if an ICBM is incoming, but the radar cannot detect what type of bomb is on the ICBM. Is it a nuclear bomb or is it a conventional bomb? So in case of some war between two nuclear armed powers, there would no doubt be missiles flying between the uh, both sides, right? Uh, some of these, even ICBMs could be um, not attacking, but, but defensive, like missile defense missiles. So, uh, the chance of missiles being used in any great power conflict is certain, right? But what's not certain is if countries would use nuclear weapons on these missiles or not, right? Um, an NFU on the part of the United States would make it clear to everyone that none of the missiles, um, flying out of the U S or at least a bit more clear that none of the missiles on the way from the U S are tipped with nuclear warheads, thus, uh, decreasing the chance of some kind of nuclear escalation. Ambiguity is bad. Third, India and China. So both of these countries have no first use policies. Both of them have decent reasons not to have no first use policies. China has enough enemies, of course, and India uh, has a nuclear armed neighbor, uh, Pakistan, who uh, if tensions are high enough, it's very easy to see some kind of a war happening between the two countries. So both of them have decent reasons not to have no, no first use policy yet. They have them anyway. So the U.S. should follow suit with this conservative, safe approach. Now, let's look at some of the rebuttals for these three arguments. So starting with the brink, we are on the brink of nuclear war. How can we answer this question? We are on the brink of nuclear war. So to respond to tactical nukes, uh, there ha these nukes have not actually ever been used in war ever, right? And there's no evidence that they would be used in war. Uh, countries that have them, like Russia and the U.S., do understand the risk of escalation once they're in play. They're not stupid about these potential risks. Second, the entire reason that weapons have been developed is so that full-scale war won't erupt. It makes the possibility the, of nuclear war more safe and would lead to less damage and would spread less radiation. So first, we don't really know that these nukes will be used. Second, if they are used, the reason that they have been developed is so that uh, escalation won't happen, right? Both the US and Russia have these tactical nukes. So it's conceivable that if even if there is a war between both sides or between uh, NATO and Russia, it's conceivable that they could both use tactical weapons for a limited nuclear strike without uh, the deadly consequences that a full strategic uh, nuclear war would involve. Uh, last, these nukes aren't new. So people may be saying that now we're on the brink of war. No, we've had these tactical weapons for a very, very long time. In fact, some of these low yield weapons are just, uh, they have similar yields to just earlier weapons. So like the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, these might consider, be considered now tactical nuclear weapons because they're not as enormous as some of the other ones that we have. Um, the M83 bomb, which, you know, that's from 1983, is a variable yield weapon that can have a yield in the low kilotons. So, um, yeah, once again, a very, very common uh, bomb from the US. It's already variable yield. It's already fairly low. It's already could be considered tactical. Uh, maybe not the M83, but some of the other weapons that we have, they're not new at all. Um, in terms of the, the cyber nuclear interaction uh, card in the brink, I would challenge the pro side to develop, to, to talk about very clearly under what circumstances could a cyber attack lead to nuclear war? Don't just say it would make things confusing or add to the fog of war or increase the probability. No. Tell me very clearly what is the logical chain that you get from a cyber attack to nuclear war. It's maybe not so um, obvious. Uh, there's no specific mechanism in this card about how they would lead to nuclear escalation. But once your opponent draws out the evidence or the logic for you, 
um, about how the uh, cyber attack could lead to nuclear war, you can start to break down and attack the uh, specific links in their argument. All right, moving on to strategic ambiguity. Um, yeah, so they say strategic ambiguity is bad. Uh, we have a card in the evidence pack from Lonoska and Shear 2017 that say that the alleged downsides of strategic ambiguity may not be so dangerous. We don't have the entire article in the evidence pack. We do have an abstract that says that, nu that strategic ambiguity is not actually that bad. Um, second, no nuclear weapons have been used in uh, 70 years. So why do we think there will be some kind of a nuclear accident now? Um, in on debatetrack.com, there are more answers to more of these things, answers to China status quo, to the future of China, to India, to a laundry list of other things, reasons why we would never want to use um, nuclear weapons. Um, so you can find that on the website, but for now we have to move on to Khan. So let's look at the Khan arguments. In short, uh, strategic ambiguity provides deterrence against many attacks on the US and our allies. Besides, nukes may be the only way to solve some problems. Lastly, Russia won't commit to an NFU, so we shouldn't handicap ourselves by committing to one as well. Because then we'd have a situation where Russia has no NFU, we do have an NFU, they have much, much more opportunities um, and strategies that they can use in their pocket that we don't have. Uh, for example, those tactical nukes that we mentioned earlier. So let's look at how we break down these con arguments. First, deterrence. If the enemy doesn't know what we're going to do, that makes them, that forces them to play a more conservative hand. Um, uh, potential first strike could protect against biological and chemical and even large conventional attacks. So there's a good reason why, um, you know, China or Russia or North Korea wouldn't want to wage any large attack against the United States. And that's because we have nukes and because we could use them anytime, right? So the fact that we don't tell anyone what we're going to do provides ambiguity, provides some fog and cover, and that prevents some things from happening uh, to the US, some attacks from happening. Essentially scares people into uh, standing back. On North Korea, so we may actually need to use a, a nuclear weapon against North Korea or a number of them. So. Uh, the North Korea's ICBM arsenal is growing. They just, uh, in a, their military parade on October 10th, showed us their largest ever ICBM. In fact, one of the biggest that we've seen in the world. And we don't know if it works yet, but it's very clear that North Korea is charging ahead with uh, both a missile and nuclear program, right? So uh, the only way that we know that we could stop them without American casualties is by uh, launching a first strike against them, which would include something like 80 different nuclear warheads. Um, so to give us more options against countries like North Korea, we should not develop an NFU. We should not adopt an NFU. Lastly, on Russia, like I said, Russia does not have a, a no first use policy. We shouldn't handicap ourselves by having one as well. Here's some pictures of uh, conventional ICBMs. Uh, by conventional, I mean normal normal nuclear weapons, normal city destroying weapons, ICBMs, and the strategic much smaller or the, the tactical much smaller nukes. All right, rebuttals very briefly because I do only have about a minute left. Um, on deterrence, um, the US provides plenty of deterrence without nukes, right? So we have the largest uh, army in the world by far, the largest military in the world by far, largest budget. So our conventional forces could easily outstrip any enemy on earth. We don't need nukes in order to prove our point. We have a plenty big military without them. On North Korea, uh, the fallout from a 80 strike nuclear, uh, an 80 weapon nuclear strike would have consequences that are not worth taking out North Korea's nuclear program for, right? In terms of civilian casualties and uh, international destabilization, uh, US global leadership, all of these things would fail. The US would never wanna do that. The consequences are much too large. And on Russia, just because Russia does something doesn't mean we should do it, right? Um, then if you would decrease the chance of a conflict and nuclear escalation with Russia, this is the most important thing, right? We can, we can always respond to a nuclear attack by our own nuclear attack, but we should have the NFU to decrease the chance of anything bad happening, any kind of accidents happening. Uh, we still have enough deterrence against Russia. 
All right. Once again, many, many more front lines in the debate track uh, website to so go check that out. Bye bye.